Well, happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dennis Ku, um, all the way from Singapore. So I'm based in Melbourne, for those that don't know, but uh, Dr. Dennis Ku is actually based in Singapore. It's great to have Dennis join us to join us today. Dennis is actually the author of a, a book uh, that was published, I think, back in September. Correct me if I'm wrong, yes, Dennis. Yeah, Driving Digital Transformation. So really excited to be able to spend some time with Dennis today to um, find out a bit more about him, his background in digital transformation, how he ended up here, and then talk about his book and some of the key concepts that Dennis covers off in his excellent book, um, Driving Digital Transformation. So Dennis, welcome. Thank you for taking some time today to join us. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Um, so, Dennis, you've got a very interesting background. You started out as a software engineer, I think, early days, and you sort of worked through a number of different organizations, and you ended up heading up a, um, a digital bank. So, how did you yeah. how did you start off in software engineering and end up heading up a, a digital bank? Yeah, it's a uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, a lot of it. Um, you know, was I must admit is due to more uh, luck and being at the right time in the right place. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, at that point in time when I was studying in Singapore, uh, engineering was a big thing. Uh, it's uh, diminished in its importance in recent years, I think because uh, Singapore has become such a large financial center. Uh, so a lot of people have gone into finance instead. But at that time, engineering was uh, really what the uh, country needed. And therefore, uh, I did uh, computer engineering. I coded in C++. And then I joined HP. And uh, I think at that point, I really didn't do much coding. I was looking after computer hardware and then the operating system. And I started a networking business uh, within HP and then you know, did some e-commerce roles, marketing roles. Um, Intel server roles. And then I got a call one day um, about joining uh, a bank. And I always thought, uh, you know, banking's uh, good because, you know, it pays well. Mm. For, of course, I, I, I should have uh, known back then that it's actually investment banking back then that made the big bucks. Uh, so I joined uh, in a marketing role uh, in uh, Standard Chartered. Uh, and then from there, uh, took on also the analytics role. And in subsequent years, uh, the 13 years I was there, then um, had the opportunity to basically do every single role in the consumer bank, uh, any all the products, right? So from wealth to deposits to uh, unsecured personal loans, mortgages, uh, the whole works, uh, before becoming the head of the consumer bank uh, in Singapore and subsequently left uh, Central Bank to join United Overseas Bank, which is a very big local bank here uh, in the same capacity. So you could say that in 2017, when I was tapped to build uh, UOB's digital bank, uh, I had undergone probably 28 years of training uh, to take up the role to build a digital bank and to uh, execute what was the biggest digital transformation project, I think, for the bank and uh, in my career. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 fantastic. And that's obviously led you to the book as well, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so would you say that someone starting out in engineering, sorry, let me take, let me rephrase that. Someone wanting to work in digital transformation should have an engineering background. Did you find that advantageous for you? Well, first, uh, you know, banking, uh, is one of those, and I think that I described this in the last chapter of my book, right? It's one of those industries that should have been more disrupted because fundamentally, uh, it's all software. It's all bits of data being moved around, right? I, I always like to tell people that, you know, in bank, you need to do three things, right? You, you have conversations with people, uh, and then you uh, collect a lot of information, and that information is now being digitized. Customers, you know, fill in the data themselves instead of you filling in forms, and then you move digits around. So I think having a software background was really helpful because uh, you, you understand the fabric of how software is created. Uh, and therefore, it's, uh, you can get into a conversation, you can get quite a deep conversation. I mean, I, I may not by then know the most uh, recent because uh, you know, things move so quickly in the software world, but you know what questions to ask. 
And so uh, it was very helpful to have that uh, software and engineering background uh, in banking, where I think most business executives, senior business executives, are kind of stunned or shocked <laughs> or just simply, uh, you know, totally uh, mesmerized or, you know, deal with the kind of headlights as far as come to technology. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's good. Um, and so your last role, which I think led you, or your last role at, at UOB where you were based, which led you to working on Tomorrow Bank, um, was effectively leading up the Tomorrow Bank launch as a digital bank. So um, tell us about why UOB decided to create a standalone bank. Uh, I think number one, it was insurance for the future. I think we, we all knew that the future would be very different. Uh, how different you know, would it be was cloudy, it was hard to see, uh, but definitely it wasn't going to be the same. Uh, so one reason was really defensive to be prepared for the future. The other reason is the unique makeup of UOB in that uh, we are a very large local bank in Singapore, but uh, also uh, the bank had acquired uh, other banks in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, during the Asian financial crisis. So we were also a regional bank. Uh, and in the consumer space, it's been very hard to expand uh, outside of Singapore through in, in the brick and mortar uh, era, where I think you know, there, are, there are restrictions for foreign banks uh, in most countries, most, most countries, most regulators, they want a strong uh, bunch of local banks uh, because when you know, things get rough, they can turn to the local banks uh, for help. So it has been very difficult for any regional player to uh, grow uh, outside their home country. Not the case for wholesale bank where you, know, you tend to be able to do that much uh, eas more easily because there, there are less restrictions. Uh, you know, you, and, and you're not talking about the deposits of citizens, which is very crucial. So the other reason was basically uh, how would we formulate a method to grow outside Singapore. And you can see that actually the countries we launched, uh, the first two countries we launched were outside Singapore. They had large uh, demographics and therefore uh, a big opportunity for UOB to increase their share uh, in, in those countries. So in the book, and you're not got... going to be able to do it using the old method anymore, right? No more, sure. no more branch by branch, uh, you know, using a lot yeah. of people kind yeah. of approach. Yeah, it, it requires, definitely requires a different way of thinking because you, you, it's, it's, um, it's that sort of famous quote, I think it's by Einstein that said, if you keep doing the same thing the, the same yes. way, you, yes. it's insanity. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think trying to quite often. Yeah. It's trying to solve the same problems using the same mindset. Six chapter book. Um, a lot, you, a lot of detail you cover off the book in terms of digital transformation. Obviously, as we just spoke about, you've just covered off the, the journey to tomorrow. Um, one area I thought was quite interesting, and I think it's a great conversation topic, is the difference between digital and bank. Uh, sorry, digital banking and a digital bank that you cover off in 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 chapter two of the book. High level terms. What does what's the difference between digital bank versus digital banking for you? So uh, digital banking is a channel, right? So like, I mean, banking was originally mono-channel in the sense that you're only branch-based for a long time, right? Then uh, uh, ATM was added, the uh, call centers were added. When the internet became pervasive, internet banking was added. Then you have mobile banking, you have mobile ba app banking. And, you know, a lot of banks still have all these channels. They're still all around. Um, so... It, seeing in that context, uh, digital banking is simply a way for you to uh, do your banking without going to a physical location. Digital bank to me is very different. The, the axis of competition is really engagement on one axis and cost on the other axis, right? The cost to uh, maintain, operate uh, on a per customer level on an annual basis. So uh, it is really an organized setup to create a very high level of experience engagement at ever decreasing costs. And based on that, uh, when you contrast that, right, you, you can't use digital banking 
to defend against an attack from a digital bank, it won't really work. And the reason why it won't, it won't work is also rooted in, in, the, in the sense that uh, the incumbent bank of any size are very complicated. You typically have a you know, couple of hundred products. None of the products usually are decommissioned. It's just added on. Those products uh, all require code, are coded in the, in the core banking system. Uh, then when you uh, overlay that with the fact that you know, there's, there, there isn't a single solution in the banking back end. So in other words, there, there's no real SAP of banking where you know, a single application may take care of 70%, 80% of all your business requirements. You, you typically would have anywhere between 50 to 100 systems for any large bank. And it's all strung together. Um, so you have a different deposit system, a different loan system, a different credit system, a different customer identification system. Then you have a lot of compliance systems, you have fraud systems, you know, you have all these things, uh, you know, bunched together. So it makes it very complicated. Then you overlay the fact that there are eight channels, right? And, and all these channels need to be integrated to the, the two uh, things I just talked about. And it's very, very complicated uh, structure. So it's going to be slow change. Um, and therefore, uh, just doing digital banking isn't going to give you sufficient uh, momentum to really improve your experience uh, and lower your cost very significantly to combat the threat of a native uh, digital bank. Something you mentioned just then, and I think you, you covered it off in the book, and I think tomorrow's vision was, at least under your leadership, I'm not sure if it still is, to be the most engaging bank for millennials. What, what does engagement represent for you? What does, it, what does it mean for you, and why do you think it's important? So if you look at banks, um, they, they really focus on transactions and information. They don't focus on helping you to act. And it's expensive to do so, right? Um, I mean, you can do it if it's a CFO, right, of a large company. So I'm sure in the wholesale bank, uh, you know, they, they take care of the CFO's requirement very well. Therefore, they take care of the company's requirement well because it's, it's big business. Uh, but for most individuals, it's, it's small, ticket, high volume. So you can't really afford uh, to spend a lot of time helping a customer to act. Of course, digital lowers that cost significantly, uh, but banks are still not uh, into that because of legacy and you know, the paradigm that has been the case for, for so many years since the creation of banks. So uh, based on that, uh, the, how you basically, I mean, the, the, the entity to, to play, right, uh, to come in is really very uh, high usability of the transacting capabilities. You have to have that as a fundamental. So the initial focus is really obsession with taking 20 things, stringing them together and making the experience very, very, very good. And, and that's very hard to do. There's no one single thing that you're going to uh, be able to do to invent that would make customers defect and come to you. Right? So that's the first play. Once you have that, then people think, yeah, okay, transactional banking should always have been this way. Hmm. And then you then focus on service, right? Because service is still a problem. Uh, you know, customers still often complain that they have to repeat uh, to the call center. Uh, call center, um, you know, may not be as correct to solve their problem at the first go. Uh, you've got to navigate the call center. It's very confusing and stuff like that. So you, th there's a lot you can do with new capabilities in chat. I think we really did uh, very well in creating uh, chat support that was very uh, effective and also very efficient. And finally, when you've done those, right, and I'm sure the top 5% of the leaders in the digital system will eventually get those two right. The other 95% may not, but the top leaders would. And then the frontier will really shift to uh, data, using data to engage customers, using data to be proactive. So as a kind of very simple example, right, um, those of us who uh, are already in, say, our uh, um, middle of our careers, we probably would have a couple of accounts uh, and we have uh, payments going to those accounts, right? And sometimes the uh, balance in one of those accounts may drop. 
because you've forgotten to fund the account because it's different from the account that your salary comes in. And then you find that actually the bank knows that the balance has dropped below the next incoming payment because they have all this data, but they don't actually inform you, right? Or send you an alert to say, hey, just click here to transfer this amount over so the next payment won't fail. So all that is known. So if you do that, you're going to be able to uh, engage your customer much better. And one of the facets of banking, right? Like it, it, it's like a utility business in a sense, right? Everybody needs electricity. Everybody needs banking. There's no one in the modern world can survive without electricity and money. Mm -hmm. So from that, from that context, um, you want to be invisible, right? Like uh, analogy I like to give is that if the man from the utility turns up your house, it can't be good news, right? Because utility is supposed to be invisible. Right? If he turns out, it means he's going to disconnect the power or you forgot to pay your bill or whatever it is. Right? So similarly, banking, the expectation for the uh, transactional piece I talked about, for the service piece I talked about, is really about, hey, uh, make it disappear. Right? I don't want to need to contact you at all for any transactional thing I'm doing. And now it's, a, it's possible to do almost all of it uh, online. For service, you know, prevent the problem from happening, solve it when it occurs. Why make me call you? Right? But in that final realm, when you get these two uh, pieces right, it's really about using data then to, again, that, that, that uh, uh, explanation, uh, or, or rather the example I gave you in terms of how a bank could uh, really be proactive, uh, also indicates that uh, when you are a utility, it's very hard to differentiate because everything is supposed to be invisible, right? But Data, using data is a way to engage you, to be proactive, to tell you that I'm really watching out for you, right, before things happen. And that's going to increase uh, experience even further from those first two uh, layers of just simply getting transaction right, which, right, mind you, there's still a lot of opportunity uh, because banks are not doing you know, such a good job. There's still opportunity to to, to lead there and to therefore penetrate and come in. There's a lot of opportunity to do support and service much better. But when the top uh, five, 10 percent of banks get that right, then that last battleground is really about using data to engage customers. Mm, no, I like that very much. I, I absolutely, it absolutely resonates with me, this concept of invisible banking in the sense of, and it's something I face it to every day, which is the, the mindset of when we deliver things for customers in digital banking, it's, it's kind of like, well, that's really great. We've delivered it, but that's that's not what customers want. They want all that all that all the services to be invisible. So customers, when they press a button, yes. it's all done for them. To exactly. your point, effectively, what it is, it's all about telling customers things that they don't know that could actually be of great value for them to actually improve their financial well being. Exactly. Um, so so you can see, you know, what's below, what's above the waterline, what's visible, right? Yeah. What's visible? They really want it to be invisible. Then what's below the waterline you don't do now because you don't have the data, you're not harnessing the data. That's what you can make visible. And that's what's going to be the differentiation. And that's going to be the, 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 the value, uh, you know, differentiation between banks that really, uh, you know, want to uh, create an experience that's, that's absolutely in the very high uh, net promoter score levels. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great segue to the next question I've got for you. So something I thought was very interesting in your book, um, which really got me thinking as well is, and I teach I teach a digital transformation strategy course, and it's something I talk about is target ambition. So it's very important to have very clear target ambitions. You don't want to set things too specific at times because it then if you're too specific, it means that people just focus on that and that becomes the measure as opposed to creating something that people really stretch themselves to kind of excel and exceed. And one yeah. of the things I thought was very interesting with, with your own experience and what you wrote about in the book was um, the minimum experience score. So you used NPS as your proxy. How did that work for you? How was, how was it successful for you? Uh, I think it was a, it's a key cornerstone, right? Because one of the things you need to figure out before you start is what kind of business you are in. So a lot of people talk about the most famous examples, right? The Airbnb, the Netflix, and so on and so forth, all the transformational businesses. But in reality, right? Um, you know, how many companies are really going to transform their business model? And, and what that really means, right, in the strictest sense that you make money differently. Banks are not making money differently. They're making money the same way. So clearly, our transformation is not a business model transformation. Then you look at transformations where raw science, there's a lot of raw science moving very rapidly, right? Like in bioengineering, 
right? The use of uh, bioengineering to create vaccines, for example. Look at the speed at which we can make a vaccine today. Uh, but look, frankly, 90% of companies are not in those two categories where you're going to change your business model and make money differently. Neither are you operating in an area where raw science is moving very fast. And digital banking, digital banks, banks are all fall in a category where it really is a humdrum traditional business. And what you need to do is continuously improve experience at ever lower and lower costs. So you need to understand that that's the business you're in first, right? And that's the business you are in, right? And, and due to just sheer competitiveness and the world being so much closer together and information being so much more readily available, you know, you can't keep things a uh, trade secret for very long. And, you know, because we've outsourced manufacturing, you can manufacture almost anything very quickly. You can replicate it. So based on that, a lot of businesses are really in the experience business. Right? You're, you're not going to find that one thing, right? that what I call the, a, a, a singular performance differentiator. And the example I like to give is the bicycle. right? So imagine we go back to the era where people were walking and now the bicycle is invented. right? The first bicycles didn't have brakes. Right? You could have to stop it with your feet. But you know, it still worked because the minimum viable product strategy works very well there right? because uh, riding a bicycle is 5x more effective right in getting from point a to point b than walking so we, if you have that you're prepared to take it up right but uh digital bank doesn't have that there's no one thing you're going to do so you're going to have to find 20 25 things that you can string together they're kind of pet peeves right but once you string them together and you do that very well uh, together it creates um, a minimum experience score and that minimum experience score, my recommendation to companies in such industries, which is almost everybody, is that mm -hmm. you have to enter at double the current industry experience score. So if the industry experience score is 20, you have to enter at 40. And this creates a virtuous uh, cycle because you are then not uh, wasting a lot of money incentivizing customers to try something that's actually quite bad. Right. And then people don't stay. They just basically take your incentive to try and then they leave. Or oh, you have to keep incentivizing them mm. uh, to, to continue to stay. Right, Because people are staying not because the experience is that great, but because you're incentivizing them to be a customer. And, and that's not going to help you because then if you, if, you, if you associate that with the path to profit, right, your marginal country is always negative. Right? So actually one of the things you can see from what I'm saying is that it, it all has to hang together. If it doesn't hang together, if one bit of it doesn't hang together, then the whole thing just kind of crashes in, in total. It's like, you know, you, you need the whole plane to fly, right? You can't have only part of the plane working because the, the, the plane will crash. That's good. One of the things I reflect on quite a lot, um, and I obviously work in digital just like you do, um, is the success stories and the failure stories. So... One of the things you mentioned in the book is um, there were a few incumbent banks that um, attempted to launch spin-off digital banks, such yes. as JP Morgan, RBS, and within a short space of time, six months, 12 months, I think, respectively, they'd shut them down. Why do you think they failed and how come Tomorrow was so successful compared to them? Or is successful? It's ongoing successful. Well, I think, I think first, uh, the the, in some cases, the, di the differentiation wasn't sufficient, right? So again, it goes back to your, your mindset, right? Are you building a better uh, digital banking? If you are, I think straight out the door, right? It's too similar. The skin is different, you know? Uh, and, and therefore, it goes back to, yeah, are you doubling your... Uh, net promoter score, which is just an indication of your advocacy, which is an indication of your experience, right? How good your experience is. Are you doubling that? I mean, that has been one of the goals, right? And, and back to what you said earlier, right? If you're too focused on the financial targets at first, it's also going to fail because it's a long-term thing. So you got to focus on the big objectives, right? You must achieve a much higher experience score on the transactional level so that when people try, they stay. Right? And, and banking is a long-term thing, right? You're not going to ship all your money over. You're going to make it a secondary account. Then you, you, as you use it, you say, well, I, I like it so much, I'm going to bring more and more money over. Then mm. one day, you know, 
your first your secondary and first account switch right and and that's all about getting a, a, a base of very active customers that give you deposits right because you need deposits to lend and but the money is all made in lending right you don't make much money deposits today due to competitiveness due to you know uh, low uh, you know interest rates so it's a long chain uh, that needs to needs to happen so if you uh, really think think about all that and you, and you put all that together uh, then I, I think it's really hard to uh, move the experience score up very rapidly right and and I, in in the case of tomorrow we weren't even talking about uh, because in the end as I mentioned earlier it's two axes right one is a better better experience at low and lower costs we'll just focus on the experience that I mentioned and to really compete with a, a, a digital challenger uh, you know like a, a cacao uh, bank or a wechat uh, we bank uh, you have to also work on the cost dimension because their infrastructure, their products are much simpler, right? So they don't have this problem that I mentioned earlier, where you know you have so many products, so many, so much of a spaghetti set of systems, there's so many channels, right? So they are very lean, uh, and, and 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 therefore much cleaner a platform they're gonna uh, start with. So based on that. Um, I think it's complicated. Most people don't get it right. The, the bankers are also stuck in a, in a certain paradigm, right? Uh, they, they have always competed on six Ps. People, place, product, uh, price, promotion, and process. Uh, five of those six are gone, right? So you don't have people, you don't have a place. Uh, products commoditized, especially if you're dealing with transactional. And you have to, most countries, you have to start with transactional. Because the wealth business, trying to enter the wealth business directly is, has its own problems. It, it, it has to be sold. It's, it's much smaller. It's usually cross-sold to a big base. Um, and then uh, price and promotion, you don't want to use because it will damage your margins. So you're left with process. Uh, and you know, if you don't choose the right person that is going to really be, be able to keep the eye on the big picture, all the things that, as you could see in the book that are interconnected, you know, have to really be managed very well. But at the same time, you need to be obsessed with process and the experience and detail. Uh, and you know, I give the example, like why is Apple uh, able to uh, be successful in the laptop business? I mean, fundamentally, the technologies are all the same. In mm. fact, you know, the screens, they don't make the screens, right? Uh, so it's all about detail. It's all about how they piece the experience together uh, and, and how, they, how you focus on the smallest details, right? And most of us are in that kind of business, but we don't realize it, right? We, we are comparing examples of Airbnb, Netflix, you know, uh, uh, places where science is moving. And, and frankly, banking, science is not moving very fast. Science is moving very slowly, <laughs> right? So, so all that is wrong, right? Can you imagine if all that is wrong, how are you going to get it right? It's, it's too hard. That's good. That's really good. I'm going to appeal to your tech, to your techie side here, given you've got a, a previous background in software engineering. And I know that you actually are very interested in technology um, and something I'm very interested in as well. And you mentioned it in your book, and that is AI, natural language processing and chatbots as well. Um, and I, I, my personal view is I think um, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of their potential and, and where that potential goes in the future is going to be very exciting. What do you, what do you see them in, what do you see the value proposition yeah of chatbots, AI, natural language processing is, and, and where do you see the future trends heading? Okay, so, so I, I think for me, uh, there are three use cases, right? Um, I think the first is really, um, can, you, can, you, can you use the data um, and really uh, figure out how you can uh, create a much higher service personalization uh, level than you, you have today uh, at a very consistent and low cost, right? That's the first uh, use case. Um, I think the second use case uh, is really in uh, how you uh, look at data and improve the product. So a lot of people can gather now, if, 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 you're, if, you, if you make a product, you can, you can have instrumentation, you can gather all that data, uh, back um, to the uh, you know to your company and analyze how people are using right. So for example, you can see if a if a if you get customer consent or even you pay a customer just for the clickstream right, 
uh, using that click stream, you can see where he's lost, right? Where your product isn't living up to mm. the expectation. Mm. So there's a big uh, a set of use case there. And then there's a use case on really replacing uh, uh, human with machine. And you hear a lot about that, right? Like in driverless cars, uh, but a simpler example is really a service. So, you know, banks still use a lot of call centers today. And uh, one of the things we set out to do was really to see how you could really provide very, very good service at very, very low cost. And I think natural language processing is one of those areas, right? Um, we started out in Thailand. So, so Thai was a, was a very difficult language, right? Um, Mm. And, and we didn't understand Thai, of course, uh, and, and we didn't know that actually you, you don't know where a, a sentence ends and one begins, there's, there's no real full stop. So we had to uh, really train uh, the natural language processing engine uh, uh, to handle uh, Thai. But it's one of those things that you can continue to teach it, right? Because every time it escalates, uh, uh, and, and in, the, in the beginning, you should design it so that it escalates quickly to a human. But then you have this whole <clears throat> mechanism that is looking at why was it escalated? Why didn't they understand? <clears throat> why didn't the chatbot understand <clears throat> what the um, customer was asking? Uh, and therefore, you can keep training it until it gets better and better and better. Uh, and <clears throat> in fact, today, uh, I think this is publicly available, stated in the book that... Uh, it has an under, uh, tomorrow by you you uh, you'll be the uh, tier which is the uh, uh, tomorrow intelligent assistant has an under, uh, natural language per se understanding rate of near ninety percent. So nine out of ten times it understands what you're saying, right? And this is the biggest problem with with chat bots, right? It actually doesn't understand what you're saying. And by putting the chat bot as a peripheral, because most of the time. Companies will ask you, do you want to use the chatbot? And you say, no, I don't want it. I'm sure you don't want to use it. No, I don't use it. True. And because of that, because, because it's a peripheral, right? It doesn't have the learning and the intensity of learning required to make it get, get better and better and better. So I think it, the case is clearly proven that uh, in many uh, use cases, uh, you can teach it and it will get better. And once it gets better, it understands what, what, what you're trying to do. Uh, then it's, it's, it's much easier to provide the solution. And so I think the applications in this area where you are replacing uh, humans with machines, and these are all in a way, uh, either pattern recognition or some kind of language comprehension kind of um, uh, uh, use case, right? Uh, they will be very suitable uh, for AI. So I, 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 I'm... My, my view on this is a little bit different from what you might hear from the pundits. I don't think you're going to see a single dramatic improvement. I think the experience is going to be similar to what we experienced, right? Where we trained it significantly. And then after uh, the launch, we continue to train it every month with, with keywords. And then you see uh, a growth of uh, the ability to comprehend that, that, that keeps going up uh, exponentially. And I think you're going to see many fields uh, where humans are, you know, doing this right now, right? In uh, uh, looking at X-rays, where it's repetitive, right? It requires comprehension. It requires pattern recognition. The advancement in this area is going to be, I think, uh, a very significant, substantial, in the next decade. Mm. And I think if you look at it from the perspective of if you can take all that natural language processing and then integrate it with robotics as well in terms of a, a robot being able to actually interact and actually action something in response to exactly. someone's conversation, right. bring those together, it's massive. The potential yeah. is massive. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, the confluence of those two domains is definitely exactly. very interesting, right? Because yeah. uh, there's, there's all the difficulty of, of comprehension. There's also all the difficulty of uh, walking, uh, uh, moving like a human being, which is actually very hard to do when you, uh, you know, look at a robot doing it, right? Whereas we take it for granted. Mm. It's, it's kind of like the Uber example. So basically Uber, um, sorry, not Uber, sorry, Tesla is, is obviously focused on car manufacturing, but what pe people don't realize is the 
use of sensors within Teslas is an enormous input mechanism to actually monitor and map out the world around yes, them. Yes. And that intelligence, that data is so valuable to other car manufacturers now that even if Tesla doesn't sort of succeed uh, as well as people would hope it would be as a car manufacturer, that core asset it has around data and that world of virtual mapping, I guess, is, is so important to other car manufacturers that could potentially be a, a massive business in its own right. In fact, uh, uh, what you're saying, right, uh, Tesla uses all three examples, right? uses uh, data to personalize, to, to support the customer in the interaction and engagement, is using information about the car, the sensors to improve the product, right? And it's also uh, using data to replace what a human would do. So Tesla is a very good example of all those three use cases at one go. And I think a lot of companies, when they, when they see that lens, right, of these three use cases, they'll be able to apply it because only traditional companies have lots of data. It's just that they don't use it today. Mm. Got a left field question for you, and it's quite a topical question that's just popped up recently in my own country here in Australia. And it's it's definitely creating a lot of debate at the moment um, amongst people working in digital banking, but just people in product management generally. And that is the, the idea of cryptocurrency and whether the bank should be supporting cryptocurrency. So to give you some context, CBA, uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia has just made a decision to actually incorporate uh, cryptocurrency effectively in their, their mobile banking app. What's your view? Uh, well, this, this topic is as complex as climate change, right? Um, you have the, the very simple view of, you know, just, uh, you know, consume less, you know, uh, and, and you know, carbon will go down. And so it's as complex in the sense that uh, if, if you think of it from a traditional sense of what's the end use case, the end use case isn't very clear, but is there a lot of interest in it now? Yes, there's a lot of interest in it, right? And therefore, if there's interest, there will be providers because there's, uh, where there's, you know, value, there's, there's money to be made, there's, there's, there's commercial uh, interest. Uh, but if you, if you look at the use case, uh, it's much more convoluted than that, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, right, the two things you, you, you really have to have in the modern world, right, uh, is electricity and money. Mm. Um, and money uh, is something that uh, is very closely tied to the economy and therefore very closely tied to the government. So the idea that uh, the government is going to allow uh, the transfer of money or the creation of money, right, without regulation uh, is going to be, I think, uh, not, not conceivable. Now, can they stop it would be a different question, right? Because mm -hmm. this is a, a private scheme, right? Anybody can set it up. So that, that, that's that question, right? That's the question that uh, is likely being also used for uh, activities that are, you know, prohibited, right? Uh, and, and, and it's a very good uh, means uh, for ex the exchange of uh, money and goods uh, in that sense because it's anonymous. It's got huge impact on uh, global warming because it takes so much to recreate everything from the first transaction, right? So it's got all these problems, uh, but yet uh, we have a growing pool uh, of uh, people interested in it. Uh, and you know you have more and more uh, currencies coming up uh, to fulfill this demand. So <clears throat> I think the jury is really out. Uh, I, I feel that um, in the end, I think the telltale signs will be around the use case because I really can't name anything that, uh, you know, for, 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 for a long period of time doesn't have a use case and is still valuable. So... In the end, that's the key, right? What is the use case? Uh, and um, uh, it is an overkill because also now uh, when, you, when you tag the name, uh, you know, blockchain on anything, the valuation of your company goes up. Uh, and, and that's part of, you know, the uh, objective, right, of the entrepreneur to have a higher valuation. But is it really needed, right? I mean, it's needed in cases where no single entity can hold a database. So if you come up with a case where, okay, it's a consortium of uh, uh, competitors and you know, no one can hold uh, you know, that, that uh, database, then yeah, I think you know, it, it solves that problem, right? But is it really better 
than uh, someone holding the database, well, the jury is out, right? Because while it has all those facets of being immutable, right? Uh, you can also hack the registry, right? And all, and all the stuff is gone, right? <laughs> and, and you think of the compute power required, right? Is it overkill? So there are so many questions about it, but it's very clear that there's a lot of interest and that interest is driving uh, the price up. And also one final thing, right? Uh, it has a, it interests a unique concept in the sense that uh, there isn't a transmission of money mechanism where the uh, what is being transmitted, right? And the means at which it's transmitted, the value is tied together. Right? Today is separate, right? I mean, the network which you, which you transmit something, like say a, a visa or mascot payment, right? For example, the, the value of that, right? The, the, the actual monetary value, because uh, it's delinked, right? It's not dependent, right? On uh, Visa and MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard, obviously, their, their value will go up as more people use the uh, means of payment. But money, the value of the money going through isn't directly related, right? To how much transactions go through. But in the case of uh, anything to do with a blockchain, money system it is. So I think there are going to be examples where you can use it uh, in B2B settings where nobody can hold the database, where you want uh, sanctity of the uh, whatever it is being pledged, right? For example, in trade financing, right? Where something's being pledged, you want to know that no one else is pledged. I think there are, uh, you know, that kind of use case can solve, but the use cases don't seem to be very pervasive. And uh, there are, I think there are clearly situations where people use it because you're going to get high valuation, not because it really uh, it, it is uh, the most efficient way of solving the problem you have mm -hmm. at hand. Yeah, I think it's, I think there are angles around it, which, you know, focus on the speculation side of it in terms of investing or not really investing, it's just gambling effectively. There are angles around from a payments perspective, but um, I haven't seen too many people or too many vendors offering to accept Bitcoin at the moment. So until you get that sort of mass mass scale of a, of a proper payments network, like you said, very problematic at the moment. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that CBA play actually plays out for them. Um, I think they're appealing to a millennial market who are obviously very interested and, and captivated by the, the craze at the moment, but how long that lasts. Yeah, I mean, for them, like it makes say. sense to, to, to offer this service because the customers want it, right? Yeah. But whether in end, what is, what, what is the end use case, right? Other than, yeah, the value keeps going up, but the value keeps going up only if someone's prepared to buy it at a higher price. Mm. The moment someone's not prepared to buy at a price, then the value drops. And that's how it, that's how it works. And people have to keep uh, wanting to buy at a high price if they're very clear what value it offers, right? And this is the part that's not very clear. What value does it really offer? Mm -hmm. True. Coming back to the book, um, you've got a very comprehensive framework, which I, I personally like, and I, I think it's very good um, for digital transformation success. And you call it the All Digital Future Playbook. And I think that's that's a real focus for your your newly launched consulting business as well and digital transformation. Um, and you cover off dimensions like customer dimension, business dimension, capabilities, people and leadership. Um, tell us more about it. How did, how, did, how did you create this framework? How does it work? And why, why did you sort of create it this way? That's a great question. Um, because after going through the experience for three years, right, which was really only uh, living, breathing every day, you know, how to go about uh, making sure that the transformation will be successful, um, uh, I left uh, EOB in the middle of last year to uh, bid for one of the wholesale bank licenses uh, in Singapore. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't win that. So uh, beginning of this year, uh, I, I started to write the book. And as I wrote that and I uh, started to think through all the things we did to make it successful, uh, it dawned on me that uh, actually it's very, very complicated. That even though for myself, right, uh, I've actually, you know, really received 25 years of training to do this, uh, many would not be in that position. And therefore, I felt that uh, a methodology is really needed in the digital transformation space. So if you see a lot of literature around it, it's really something mostly about what and why. I think the why is settled, right? If anybody is uh, still asking why, then he's likely to be a, a, a laggard in his, in his uh, you know, a, a very late majority uh, in his industry. Uh, the what, I think, is uh, a big problem. 
Because if you Google digital transformation, you get lots of entries and they are usually platitudes, mm. you know, like uh, uh, get top management support, hire the best. You know, those things don't help uh, you at all. Uh, in any company of any size, right, it's going to be very complicated. And therefore, uh, as I thought through it, you know, how could I uh, make an impact in helping companies raise their probability of success? And the probability of success is low. Uh, if you uh, depend on who you speak to, right? Anywhere between 70 to 95% of all digital transformations fail. Uh, and uh, IDC in 2018, uh, I think that year, they estimated $1.3 trillion was spent by companies of which $800 billion didn't meet their objective. And therefore, there's a very big opportunity to introduce a methodology. And all the literature out there, right? There is nothing that, uh, it's a holistic uh, approach for the senior team. And my methodology, uh, the All Digital Future Play, is really targeted at the uh, chief executive responsible for the transformation plus his team. There's nothing like that. So you, of course, you have many uh, approaches, right? Like digital, uh, in, in digital transformation, for example, um, in design thinking, mm. uh, in change management, in agile, in lean, right? Uh, you've got all that kind of stuff. And of course, you've got the traditional business management uh, techniques, right? Like what I mentioned in the business dimension, right? Uh, differentiation, uh, the path to profit, scaling. But you also got to overlay the design because design is now critical, right? In fact, in every single transformation, uh, there's an overemphasis on technology, right? Uh, it's really not just about technology, it's about really a very good design. Uh, followed by excellent processes. And if you have those two in general, right, unless you have very complex back ends, like a bank, right, it's generally quite straightforward because the technology to create the front isn't very complicated. There's a shortage of resources, certainly, but, you know, it's not anything that is very difficult science. So uh, th this methodology then allows you to raise your probability of success significantly because it shows you all the considerations you need to take care of and how they're intertwined and how they are circular in a sense that if you if you handle something uh, incorrectly, it can actually reverberates, come back and it hit you. And a very simple example is uh, if you look at your proposition, right? And if you want to create a strong proposition, then your, your differentiation is good, but it's very likely your core competence gap is very big, right? between what you have now and what you need. And your core competence is very big, likely you have executional issues, you have scaling problem. If you have scaling problem, then your uh, revenue is low and your cost is already there. So your profit is going to be affected. Then if you think about it, then you want to lower your differentiation. But if you lower your differentiation, then uh, you also have a scaling problem because uh, against a competitor, you might not be competitive. Against alternatives, you might not be attractive, right? And in that case, then again, you have revenue uh, shortage and costs are already in, although the costs are lower. So you've got these circular problems throughout uh, the entire fabric uh, of the difference. And that's why I created those four domains and attempted to show how those domains and elements interact. And it gets complicated very quickly. So you got, mm. you got four dimensions. And when I show those four dimensions to key business leaders, they say, yeah, this is quite, quite uh, obvious, right? But the four dimensions lead to 19 elements and the 19 elements lead to more than 56 considerations. And very quickly, it gets very complicated. And most people don't want to handle that complexity because they want to, today you want to go for the platitudes, right? Mm. The six things you can do. That will solve everything. You know, unfortunately, in, in a complex transformation, that doesn't exist. And so the ability to navigate this complexity, the ability to handle the ambiguity, right? Because there will be things you don't know, and you attempt to rush and solve everything very quickly, it's going to fail immediately, right? Because you haven't thought things through uh, properly. So I think the uh, playbook fills a gap in the market today uh, that no one is providing. And uh, you know, this is, I guess, my contribution back uh, in terms of how to make this very pervasive so that uh, companies can be much more effective in their digital transformation. And, and that alone could affect many things, right? Including how efficient they are, and that alone could affect uh, how much, uh, how big their carbon footprint is. Mm, I, I sort of chuckled before when you mentioned the the idea that um, sort of platitudes around sort of hiring a couple of people, throwing them in there, hopefully they've got the experience around with it because I think it's quite a common, it's a common approach. Um, 
what I like about the framework is it 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 gives you something to work with and it's structured, but it also acknowledges that there's no easy road here. That everyone from the top leaders right through to the people actually responsible for execution have to roll their sleeves up and get into it. Um, exactly. And 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 you know, there's no easy road here. And effectively giving giving them a framework, even though as you mentioned, when you start to break it down, it can get complex and obviously the interdependencies can be challenging. Um, at the same time, having a compass like this can be really invaluable. Exactly, and 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 uh, I encapsulate what you just said, right? It is really the how. We are not talking about why anymore. Otherwise, you're really yeah. a lagger in your industry. The what is uh, uh, actually one of the big problems, right? So everybody thinks they know what, and then nobody knows how. So this really focuses on how are you going to go about it. And unfortunately, one of the additional problems you have in the digital transformation is that the thinking and doing are fused. Right? And when the thinking are doing a fuse, the how and the what interact significantly. And it causes even more problem, right? Uh, because the how now changes the what. And so this uh, makes it actually, and, and so when you think about it, then you think, hey, of course, you know, it's, th there will be a lot of failure, right? So one of the interesting things was after I created the framework, I looked at it and said, yeah, this explains, you know, why so many transformations fail. It's been a busy few year for you, uh, Dennis. So obviously you spent the last 12 months sort of working on a few things and obviously writing the book would have taken a lot of time and a lot of focus. What's next for you? Uh, well, one thing I want to do is uh, get the book more pervasive, get in the hands of more uh, you know, executives uh, so that um, they understand the issues that they are faced with. Uh, digital transit is only going to grow. It's not going to become less. Right, uh, and, and this is one way to make sure that um, money is spent better. I'm also working on the next uh, book, which is a playbook. It expands chapter five of the book into a step-by-step -step, uh, playbook for companies that you can just pick up uh, and you, know, you, can, you can then try it on your own. And of course, you know, if you need help, uh, you know, we can always provide uh, the assistance to train. And, and this is less of a consulting business. It's more uh, to train in the methodology so you're self-sufficient. Mm. And, and one of the gaps in the market today is that because nobody has a methodology, nobody trains on the methodology, actually you're overly dependent on consultants. And, and a, one of the facets of this is that actually the majority of consultants haven't done it. So while they may be very bright and they may get you know, a lot of the links correct in the frame and they can frame the problem properly, uh, the, the fact that the thinking and doing are fused causes a lot of problem. And therefore, uh, the idea here will be train everybody, including the consultants so that you have one method, one language. And believe me, it, it really simplifies the problem because uh, I, I easily, when I talk to uh, you know, experts in this area, it would shortcut by at least 50%. And if I had this in 2017, it would have made it much easier uh, to go about you know, uh, raising the probability of success and making the transformation uh, happen you know, in, a, in a much shorter period of time. So your book's out, you're released in September. Where is it available? Where can people buy from? Uh, so uh, for those of you who are digitally inclined and you know, no longer read physical books, then uh, <laughs> go to you know, amazon.com and download it instantaneously to read. Uh, those of you who still need the hard copy, right? You, you, you're still uh, you're very digital, but you, know, you need the hard copy. Uh, the hard copy is available uh, in, in Amazon Singapore. Uh, or, and right now it's restricted to... Uh, just delivery in Singapore. You'll be available in the UK, uh, hard copy on the 15th of January uh, next year. Uh, and for the time being, uh, you know, while the physical books are making their way, uh, you can go to my website, uh, alldigitalfuture.com slash bookstore and order a copy, uh, which I autograph and ship uh, internationally. Awesome. We'll provide links at the end of this as well so that, that uh, anyone that's watching this can actually access uh, your website as well, which is all digitalfuture.com uh, forward slash book for digital driving, uh, sorry, driving digital transformation. Dr. Dennis Koo, thank you very much for your time. It's been great talking to, talking to you today. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation and uh, maybe we'll have future opportunities to discuss more, even more interesting topics. Thank Love you, to. Brian. Th thanks again, Dennis. See ya. Thank you.